So, my name's Kyla. And I'm Jill. Um, in case you get them confused. And uh, thanks for being here. So, today we don't want to dig too much into anything technical or the gear we use. What we really want to show you and tell you is our story. We're not even going to show you really our best work. Um, more of a complete picture of what we've been up to. So, um, in sharing that, we want to show you how we turn this unintentional personal project into our full-time career of living and working on the road. So, as Iris said, we started Our Wild Abandoned four years ago with very little expectation of what it would eventually become. We went from these two girls on a road trip to working as full-time photographers. It was a dream that we truly never thought would be possible for us. We now work with numerous tourism and travel companies, as well as some of the largest tech companies in the world, including Google, LG, and Samsung. Our travels and our work have taken us across the country and back into parts of the world we honestly never thought we'd get to see. So today, we want to talk to you about how we took this leap to get where we are, what we overcame to get here, and how not to give up. And our goal in sharing this story is to hopefully inspire and encourage you to think differently about your own path and maybe even make some changes to get you to where you want to be. Um, so to start at the very beginning, I grew up in a really small town of about 5,000 people, essentially in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was a couple hours away from the Alaskan border. <laughs> this was a self-portrait. <laughs> And um, I spent you know, all my time doing what really every teenager does, just counting down the days until I could graduate and get out of there. And when I did, I got out of there. Um, I hit the ground running, hopped on a train, traveled across the country for a couple months, and then enrolled in a really kind of fancy overpriced art school. Um, I was very convinced at the time that I was going to just change the world through my pictures. I had always wanted to be a photographer, um, and I was kind of coming as a big fish from a small pond. Um, in the town that I grew up in, I had been you know, praised for my creativity, and um, I really thought that I had a chance to make it out there in the real world. And you know, once I got out there and started actually trying to build a career as a photographer, I realized it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, for one thing, I didn't actually know what it was that a professional photographer really even did, which was a big problem. Um, <laughs> I kind of assumed that there were three major trajectories, um, one of them being weddings, one of them being National Geographic, and one of them being fashion. And weddings were very intimidating to me. National Geographic has not returned one of my emails so far, so we'll be in touch after this. <laughs> and um, so I ended up in fashion. And the problem with me working in fashion is I um, am not a fashionable person. I was not inspired by fashion in any way. Um, and so I basically spent the whole time just mimicking and emulating what I would see other people do. I kind of based my career off of um, Nigel from America's Next Top Model, and that is what I tried to do. <laughs> um, so I probably don't need to clarify this too heavily, but it wasn't paying the bills for me. And before long, I, I had to get a day job, and that day job, as the bills kind of piled up, turned into a day job and a night job. And I kind of had to shelf my camera and just focus heavily on you know, staying afloat. And I remember really distinctly calling my parents and just apologizing, um, you know, for even going to art school in the first place, because at that point, I had thought that I had made a really terrible mistake. I thought, oh, oh no, I don't actually want to be a photographer unless, you know, someone's going to pay me to take photos of my friends hanging out. <laughs> Um, I also came from a very small town in BC, and for me, at a very young age, I fell in love with the landscape of America and, and this whole country. And, you know, poring over these books and music and, and different movies, I was a pretty big Springsteen fan at a young age. Um, I kind of spent all this time idealizing what it would be like down here, but, you know, 
I didn't see a way, a way to get here, especially from where I was from. And then uh, one day when I was 17, my dad made this really small oversight that ended up changing my whole life. Um, he lent me his company gas card on my way to school, and I ended up leaving for two and a half months with it. And heading as far south as Tijuana, as far east as Colorado, to the west coast and back home. And it was incredible. I saw all these things I'd been reading about and hearing about, and I could only eat at a Chevron, so it wasn't luxurious. I slept in my car, but I finally got to see all these places. And I came home and obviously had disappointed my family, and I thought, okay, that was fun, but I need to grow up, so I know, I'll go to school. And I actually decided to study art history and aviation. So in school, I loved what I was learning. I really did. Um, it was really interesting, and, and I loved learning about art, but eventually, all these slides, day after day, you know, photos of things that exist out in the real world, it started to have the same effect that those books and those songs and those movies had on me, where it just didn't feel like enough. And being a student, I couldn't afford to, or I didn't have the time, and I couldn't afford to get out there and travel, so I thought the next best step would be to, to drop out and get a real job. And in doing that, I would at least be able to get two weeks paid vacation every year, and I'd make the money to, to make the most of this time. So I ended up going into real estate, and at first it felt you know, pretty good. I was taking care of myself. I had an office. I had a closet with a whole bunch of blazers in it, and I felt like an adult. Um, and I, that was okay for a while, but eventually I realized that my creative side was not being utilized. I, I was actually working too much to get out there and actually travel and take advantage of these vacations I was supposed to get. So I wasn't sure where I was going to go with it, but I remember very distinctly having dinner with my dad and, and complaining on end about my job. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I'm not really sure. He's like, well, think about what you want to do and make that your job. And I remember saying to him, I just want to drive across the country with my friends. No one's going to pay me to do that. Um, so at this point, both Kyla and myself are living in Vancouver. We've kind of come to terms with the fact that maybe our lives are not going to amount to everything that we had hoped they would. Um, sort of resigned ourselves to that. We're feeling a little bit discouraged. And so we enter into really serious, long-term relationships with two guys that happen to be best friends. And so that's how her and I would meet. And you might think that when we met, it was this you know, magnetic experience where we were drawn to each other and we became instant best friends. Um, but that was not the case whatsoever. We were merely acquaintances, really, for about four years while we dated these guys. And I think that the reason behind that is because neither of us were doing anything in our lives that we were really proud of, and we felt no reason to talk about ourselves. So for four years, these conversations just kind of revolved around whatever exciting thing my boyfriend was doing or you know, the cool new job he had just gotten and how excited I was for him. Um, and that went on you know, for a long time until one day, out of nowhere, we both found ourselves single in the same week after four years of being in a relationship. Valentine's Day weekend, <laughs> 2013. <laughs> And, um, and so in that, I did what most people that are coming out of a long-term relationship do. I start grasping at people around me to figure out who's going to be on my side. <laughs> and in that grasping, I got a hold of Kyla for the first time really ever. Um, up until that point, I never even had her phone number. And so we hung out together. And at first, it was a little bit awkward because we had never had a conversation. Um, but you know, a bottle of wine kind of helped get the conversation going, and then four bottles of wine really, like, really got the conversation going. And all of this stuff came out about how we had really grown up in parallel kind of circumstances, and we had these exact same kind of hopes and dreams to travel the American road and to see all of these different things. And we both felt really strongly about all of the same things. And so, you know, a little bit drunk, we kind of came up with this plan, like, 
what if we just leave? Let's get out of here. Let's leave our lives behind and like take off and never come back. And um, much like Thelma and Louise, of course. <laughs> we didn't kill anybody though. Um, and, <laughs> and admittedly, this was a really, really dramatic response to a breakup. I, I do not behave that way anymore. Um, <laughs> because no one will break up with me. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was an important conversation and then it just really got the, the wheels turning in our head. And that night with Jill was pivotal. Um, the next morning I was alone in my new, empty, sad apartment and I was unpacking this box of stuff that I had kept at my dad's house. And within that box was actually a jar of salt that I had collected from the Utah Salt Flats. Um, the Bonneville Salt Flats outside of Salt Lake City. And I collected that on that very first trip with the Chevron card, and I'd always kept it. And I remember pulling it out and just thinking, like, being overwhelmed after that night and talking about all these things we wanted to see and then being confronted with this object that represented such a specific time in my life. And just being overwhelmed with this urge. And I just wanted to be back there so badly that I ended up texting Jill. Um, actually, do you want to go to Salt Lake City? I think we had plans to walk our dogs. You know, if we leave right now, um, we, can make it by the, we can make it by sunrise and watch them on the salt flats. Please say yes. Um, she said yes. <laughs> so about five minutes after I got that text message, I called into work and said that I was sick, which they can't fire me for now, so that is what I did. I was not sick. Um, I drove <laughs> to Utah with Kyla, and um, we assumed because we were heading so far south, it was about like a 20 hour drive, that it was gonna be a lot warmer where we were heading, and we, I remember very distinctly cutting the legs off of my jeans on the drive there. Um, it's February in Utah still. <laughs> Not warm. It's still February there. <laughs> so that was cold, um, but in those four days that we were gone, it was just this quick trip, but we had more fun than I can remember having for the last four years. Um, it was this really incredible kind of reckless, but like whirlwind experience that showed us just a little glimpse of what life could be like if we were to travel together. And so on the drive home, we kind of set about making a plan. And so this big great plan was to leave town. It was that simple. Um, so we set about the way, or saving up money to make this trip possible. That was really the biggest thing for us. And the ways we save money, Jill ended up moving in with me into that new sad apartment that was really small. Um, she was working at a restaurant, so we pretty much survived off of leftover burrito ingredients, not even burritos, just the ingredients, <laughs> for months. Um, we worked nonstop, like nonstop. It became really easy to save up this money once we started equating um, you know, money with gas and then gas with miles, so it was really p easy to you know, not go out for lunches and, and not buy dumb things. Um, and then we also decided that since we weren't going to, I was gonna leave that place and I didn't wanna have all my things anymore. And over the years, I, I collected all these objects and furniture and all this stuff and the more I wanted to leave town, the more heavily those things weighed on me. I felt suffocated by them. So eventually I listed all of my belongings and all of Jill's on Craigslist. And I can't explain to you the lightness and relief I had as every one of those objects left the door. I can't explain to you that one day I came home and she had sold my bed before we left, and that was, that did not make me feel light. <laughs> it was like a month, a month or two before we actually got to go. Um, and then at that point we started looking for a trailer, um, having something like a home on the road. And we ended up naming her Bobby Jean after the Bruce Springsteen song about his girlfriend that leaves home and doesn't come back. And you can see that she was, you know, old and, or she was vintage, but in the way that she was old and affordable. She, no one, she wasn't a collector's item, but she was sweet. And Bobby would become a critical purchase in many ways. It allowed us to save a lot of money, which again, at this point, we had none. So we could cook all of our meals, never pay for a place to stay, make our own coffee, that type of thing. Um, and the best part was that we got to be away from home, but have this semblance of home. So every night we fell asleep in our own beds, surrounded by the very few things that didn't get sold from underneath you. <laughs> um, 
The one thing we didn't account for though, and so when we were ready to leave town, we had we'd painted her and made her really cute and got her all packed up, but um, we'd actually never driven a trailer before. So we learned pretty quickly what it's like to tow a thousand pound trailer behind your car on the interstate in those first few days. So something else that happened in those first few days, and this is something that I would have never in a million years predicted, is that I found myself for the first time in so long, actually wanting to take photos again. Um, right before we had left, I had come really close to selling my camera. I just didn't have any desire to use it. I wasn't happy taking photos. It seemed like a really unusable thing to bring. Um, but then all of a sudden, you know, in the first few weeks of this trip, we're in a different place every day and we're surrounded by things we've never seen before and experiencing them all for the first time. And more than that, I'm watching my best friend experience these things for the first time as well. And all of a sudden, I'm incredibly inspired. And I think, you know, before that, I had always gone out when I was working in fashion and tried to kind of manufacture a moment or create some sort of feeling in my images. And, and now I didn't have to do that because these moments and these feelings were happening right in front of me and I had this drive to create that I had really never felt before. Um, and that drive really extended beyond myself and to Kyla as well. So all of a sudden, this little point and shoot that she had been carrying around really wasn't cutting it for her. She wanted to capture images that showed you know, the things that she was seeing in a, in a real way. And so I started slowly teaching her how to use a DSLR. And that was important for me because it reminded me that all of these things that I had learned in school that I didn't care about were actually really, really important and they meant something and I couldn't forget them even if I wanted to. So for the first time ever in my life, I was excited to talk about these things like apertures and shutter speeds and whatnot because I saw how much it could empower a person and really bring the photos to life. Um, so then, we're creating all of these images together and, and both of us are really you know, working on each one together as a, as a unit. And we're proud of the images that we're making and we decided we want to start sharing them with people. So we came up with the idea to start a joint Instagram account and a joint blog and just kind of funnel all of this work into one place. And we called this collaboration Our Wild Abandon. Um, neither of us can remember where that name even came from at this point, it just seemed like kind of a fitting title for what was supposed to be a little project. Um, something that we wouldn't have expected is that over a really short time, it amassed a huge following of strangers from all over the world. We grew to have over 100,000 followers on Instagram really quickly. Um, this is the part in the talk where I would love to just give you the one secret to that so that you could all run out and do it too. It's a lot more than one secret. It's, there's a lot of factors that kind of come into play there. Um, and tomorrow, if anyone is interested, we're giving a talk on the small stage at 10 a.m. and we're just gonna go over kind of all of the intricacies of um, building a social media following and maintaining it and using it to build your business. But for right now, I will say that the most important thing that we were doing with the work that we were sharing is we were showing images of something that a lot of people had dreamed about, but we were showing it in a way that was, seemed achievable. Um, unlike a lot of these other travel Instagrams that were really polished and had you know, these beautiful supermodels in exotic locations, you had us in exotic locations <laughs> and, um, and it was, you know, they were raw and a little bit more real and natural, and I think people could relate to this and they could see themselves in our photos. Now, you're gonna um, notice a pattern pretty quickly here that every time I get to speak, I have to tell you something terrible that happened to us. So within a month on the road, just as all this momentum was building, we ended up broken down just outside of Moab, Utah. And I mean really broken down, like that thing wasn't going anywhere. So much so that when we got a tow, they took us to a junkyard instead of a repair shop. <laughs> um, so here we were on the side of the road waiting to get rescued. And 
we ended up in this junkyard and the mechanic tells us there, he's like, you guys have a seized engine. You're not gonna go anywhere. It's gonna cost you thousands to repair it and I don't know how much money you guys have. And at that point, we had about $50 more than the cost of the repair. So it wasn't enough to fix it and even get home and it definitely wasn't enough to fix it and keep going. And we were feeling really defeated and incredibly angry, <laughs> if I'm being honest. And that night, they actually let us stay in the yard, um, which was really sweet of them because we couldn't afford a hotel in Moab. And I remember going to bed and we weren't really sure what we were gonna do, you know. We, we talked to our parents and they had just suggested that we fly home and, and leave the car and the trailer and, and get on with it, but we didn't want to at that point. So that night, going to bed in my, in my side of the trailer, um, I was looking at my phone and I realized that someone had commented, you know, on one of the images we had posted, can I get a print of this? And it was one of those light bulb moments where I realized that what we were creating had value, you know, real tangible value. And it was possible we could make our way on the road through our work. So the next day we woke up and we, we talked to the guys at the yard and we asked if we could stay and they gave us their Wi-Fi password and we built a web store um, while living in the junkyard. And <laughs> <laughs> what happened next? They're so proud. <laughs> uh, um, and what was amazing is that through social media and through our, our network we have built, we sold thousands of prints within a few days. And these, were, these prints were getting mailed all over the world. And we actually made enough money, and we were charging a lot, so we sold quite a bit. And we made enough money to not only fix the car, but to keep going. And the biggest lesson in this exercise was that we all of a sudden realized that this wasn't just a, a road trip and it wasn't just about being popular on social media. What we were creating, people, you know, it had a tangible value and there was a worth and that changed our momentum moving forward. Um, so after the car was fixed, we head out on the road and we're excited. We have this momentum. We feel like we're working towards something finally and we, make our way through California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana. Um, and the cool thing about having this trailer is that it allowed us to move really slowly. We never had to drive super fast to get to our motel that night. You know, we weren't just blitzing through a town and jumping out and taking a photo at the closest landmark. We were really immersing ourselves in these communities and getting to know the people around us. So if anyone has ever told you not to talk to strangers, I cannot stress how wrong that sentence is. Um, talking to strangers was one of the most important things that we did. It was these strangers that would you know, become curious in our journey and they would want to show us around their town and introduce us to other people and that's how we ended up getting some of our best work was through these people that we met along the way and, and the way that they kind of introduced, introduced us to people as we moved forward. So we just kept going and going, um, taking literally tens of thousands of photos and the whole time our circle of friends and our audience was kind of growing along the way. And you know, this buildup of momentum and, and moving across the country was so exciting and, and we found ourselves you know, five months in, in Louisiana and Someone kind of asked us, they said, when are you going home? And we didn't even think about that at that point, but we had this realization that we were Canadians on a tourist visa. So we were only allowed 182 days. So no matter how many postcards we sold, there was, you know, you can't argue with the government. So all of a sudden we had to make this decision to turn around and go home, right in the midst of all these good things happening. So, you know, I, this is how I felt about it. Um, we had to make the drive home in about three weeks straight. So coming back to Vancouver was a very harsh you know, dose of reality. We had been gone just long enough that we had kind of forgotten what our old lives were like, um, but not quite long enough to really <laughs> achieve anything. Um, we were getting a little bit of press though. We were getting some recognition for our photos. They were being published in magazines and we were doing some interviews about our work. And that was really exciting, but it was frustrating as well because every single one of these publications talked about the work that we had created as if it existed inside this isolated bubble that was limited 
to one road trip that we took in the past. It was always referred to in the past tense, and it was never talked about as if it was you know, a sustainable path or something that we could keep creating after this final trip. Um, and we knew, we didn't know, but we thought that you know, there might be something more to this. Maybe we could turn this into a career. Um, our families were a little bit nervous about that. They didn't, you know, it didn't quite add up for them. But luckily, within about two weeks of getting home, we got our first job offer. And this job offer was exciting because it was the first one. It was exciting because it was a job <laughs> offer, which was something that we very desperately needed. Um, but most of all, it was exciting because it was a travel company that wanted us to shoot commercial work, branded work for them, but from our point of view. They said that they loved our personal work, they loved what we had created on this trip, and they wanted us to use our point of view and our voice to share their message. And that felt really good. Um, so these, these jobs kept coming over the year. Um, we went to Italy, England, Scotland, um, the Caribbean, Colombia, this little country we'd never heard of called Dominica, which is a beautiful place. Um, and it sounds amazing and exciting, it, it was, but it was really tricky to kind of make work because we weren't getting paid very much for these jobs at all. Um, but we couldn't get full-time jobs because no one would really allow us the time off, you know, to go and do these assignments. So we had to kind of get the like, part-time jobs that would be flexible enough and patient enough with us to let us go off whenever we wanted to. And a lot of people just didn't really understand what it was that we were trying to do. Um, there was a big discrepancy between what you saw on the internet and our real life. Um, you know, on the internet we were all over the place and traveling and jet set, and in my real life I was working for minimum wage at this burrito restaurant. Um, and we were sharing a, stu a studio <laughs> apartment, you know. Um, when we went to Italy, we left on a Friday morning and got back that Monday. So we were gone for 72 hours. And I went into work the next day on the Tuesday, dressed in every single thing that I had bought in the gift shop. So this chef's hat that said pizza all over it and an apron with like the statue of David's bought, like naked body <laughs> as an apron on my body. And I was so excited for everyone to ask me how my trip was. And they're like, what did you get up to this weekend? And I was like, oh, I got sent to Italy for work. And every single one of my coworkers just stared at me blankly like, what? like you work at a burrito restaurant, what are you talking about? You know, I saw you on Friday, you didn't go to Italy. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> but she sure did. <laughs> so. Here's Jill at Budgie's Burritos. <laughs> there was some talk about whether we were gonna be able to find this image or not, but so I guess we did it find it. was two iPhones ago. Uh, anyways, there was a lot of instances like that that were really just tough to kind of juggle, and they were tough for people to make sense of. Yeah, it was, you know, I was working. <laughs> I like that one. Um, I was working as a personal assistant making smoothies every morning for an executive, yet the next week someone was sending me to Belize to be served these different meals and drinks, and it was just all so crazy. I, I lived in the studio with Jill, and I slept behind a shower curtain in a hallway, and so the mix of these, of these two lives was so strange, but it was also really, really hard to juggle, and there was a point where we had to work so much, and we really couldn't sustain it in a healthy way, and I was just getting really worried, and we almost gave up, um, but we thought this isn't fair because during all of this, we were getting real job offers from American companies. So they wanted us to come back down and, and recreate content for them, or not recreate, make new content for them based off of what we had done on the road. So really stay true to our point of view that we found and, and create work for them. But we legally couldn't take them because we are, we are from Canada and we knew that. Um, so at this point, we get into the immigration process. Um, and the first time the lawyer explained what it took to apply for an artist visa, I think we both cried. Um, it was terrifying. And it was hard enough to convince our parents what we were doing was a legitimate job, but we were now tasked with explaining it to the Department of Homeland Security. So <laughs> it, was, it, 
was a lot. And I'm not gonna get too much into it, but at its core, it's about a dozen or so letters from experts in your field. And at that point, I don't think I, I knew an expert. Um, you know, we were kind of grasping at straws. Who, who do we know, who do we know? And then it, it came to us that we had found this incredible community of people on the road, you know, through our travels on the road or through social media, people that, you know, came from all different backgrounds and all different levels of success, and they were more than willing to help us. So it took a long time, but we were able to finally apply. And then once we applied, it took forever and longer than it was supposed to. So we would kind of come to terms with the fact that it wasn't gonna happen. And a lot of our dream relied on, on this visa, being able to come back down. And so to not get it would be a huge blow professionally, but also personally, because it would affect our ability to come back down, especially with a camera in our bag, you know, ever again. Um, but I get to give some good news <laughs> this time. We did get our visas, and that was a huge turning point for us. We were able to pretty much pack up and head south right away. <laughs> so we had headed down to California in record time. Um, it was December in the Pacific Northwest. We didn't want anything to do with it. We got down there and spent this one beautiful, perfect night camped by the Salton Sea. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Salton Sea, but it's this incredibly kind of desolate and vast landscape that really suited us in that moment so well because we had this kind of us against the world feeling and we felt really excited about, you know, what the next few years were gonna look like for us. And we had this perfect night. It's honestly one of the best nights of my life because we were really charged up and feeling, you know, super optimistic and electric. And we took thousands of photos that night and just stayed up until five in the morning or something. And I remember when I fell asleep that night just kind of planning out what the next five years of my life were gonna look like and how I was gonna get to all these places that I've always wanted to be and I was gonna take all of these photos that I had imagined. Um, I don't know if you have ever heard that saying, if you wanna make God laugh, you can tell him your five-year plan. <laughs> that was the funniest joke he had ever heard in his life. Um. <laughs> so this is actually from the very next day. This is. Um, Bobby Jean in front of the Salvation Mountain sign that reads, God never fails. And this is the last photo we have of Bobby Jean. Um, within an hour of this photo, um, we were in a, in a rollover accident. And I still don't know how many times we flipped, but we ended up trapped in our vehicle and I was hanging from the driver's side and we couldn't get out and it was this dark road and I was pounding on the horn because I couldn't get out of the vehicle and no one was stopping which was really crazy, and finally this man came and he, he pulled us out from the back window that had, had been smashed, and the whole time all I could think about was, you know, why'd this happen, but also what, what am I gonna get out of here and see? What, what's behind our car? And, you know, we get out and our, our whole trailer, everything, this dream we had built and we had worked on and we were a week into living um, was gone, and the paramedics arrive and, when I got out of the trailer, or out of the truck, and Jill came out behind me, we just both looked at one another, and we couldn't believe that we were okay. And when the paramedics came, they, they couldn't believe it either. And you know, we, were, we were crying, we were upset, and, and they kept trying to comfort us and say, you know, that stuff's just stuff, that's just stuff. But um, that had really been our dream at that point, and there it was on the side of the road. And it honestly felt like a house fire more than a car accident. Um, so this was you know, obviously terrible for us. And at that point, I didn't really understand it. I kind of said, like, is, is this the end for us? Is this, was this a sign? Do we need to stop? Are we gonna go home? You know, where do we go from here? I miss um, her. <laughs> and realistically, that would have been a really good time for us to quit. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, and you know, we had these visas, but there, we didn't really know if we were gonna be able to make money with them. Um, and so now, literally every single thing that we owned was, looked like that, it was destroyed. And so, you know, there was a check coming from the insurance company, we had two plane tickets booked home. Um, and if we had wanted to, that would have been, you know, the time to say, okay, we tried our best, like we did the best that we could do. This wasn't our fault, this was a freak accident, and 
you know, what more can we do? Like, that's it. Um, but we kind of sat on it for a couple days and we came to each other after thinking and, you know, both of us agreed. We were like, this is not gonna be the way that this ends for us. Like, we have tried for the last two years to make this a reality and it's so close right now. Like, I can't, I can't let it go like that. Um, so the first thing that we did was, you know, kind of dust ourselves off and, and get back out there and, um, and we bought a brand new trailer. Well, I mean, it's not brand new, it's about 50 years old, but it's um, <laughs> new to us. It was brand new to us. And we focused all of the energy and frustration that we had from this accident into absolutely gutting this thing. Um, tore out everything in there and rebuilt it all anew. Um, which was an incredible thing. It's an empowering feeling to kind of build your home with your own hands. We didn't know that we knew how to do that, um, but we did and we turned this um, kind of shell into a really wonderful home for ourselves and it's, it's better than it ever was before. It kind of functions as a, you know, both a home but also an office and a studio and really everything that we need to make this into both a home and a career space for us. Um, so once the trailer was ready, we hit the road again, and, and for the first time, it kind of felt more like we were running towards something than running away from it. And we've really accomplished this goal of, of living and working and balancing it all, you know, finally after all of this. We've been on the road now for, I guess, over a year, and in that time, we've driven across the entire country. We're missing, I think, West Virginia, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. We did Alaska and Hawaii. Um, We've been able to sign with a photo agency here in New York called Tinker Street. And we spend a lot, you know, all of our time just balancing, creating personal work still, always from the road, and documenting our lives, but also shooting commercial work with social media and removed from social media. In this last year, we've been able to work with um, Google, Samsung, Nature Valley, Kia, and we do a lot of tourism work. So tourism boards from um, Hawaii to New Orleans. So, this whole process has really taught me, or taught us, mostly me, just kidding, <laughs> taught us both so much about friendship, collaboration, gratitude for still being alive, and how resilient we can be when we work together as a team. Now, working together like this works for us. I know that might not be the case for everyone, um, but we can't stress enough that you, you can't underestimate the power of collaboration. We, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you know, working with other people and getting feedback and, and asking for help and, and reaching out to our community. Um, I definitely never thought I'd be here on the stage giving life advice when I quit my job. Um, so I really can't stress enough, you know, to trust others and, and trust yourself and, and work together. I literally did not know that the career that we have right now was a job that existed. Um, I had no idea. So when I was talking to my parents saying, well, I wish someone would pay me to take photos of my friends hanging out, or Kyla you know, told her dad that she wanted to get paid to drive across the country, um, we had no idea how possible that really was. I mean, it's a lot more than that, but at its core, that is what we get to do. Um, I think for so long, I was trying to kind of wedge out this space for myself in the world of photography, and I would do that by emulating what I would see other people do. Um, not as well as they would do it. And something that never occurred to me was that, you know, if I'm just making bad representations of other people's work, why on earth would anyone hire me? Why wouldn't they just hire the person who's doing it well? Um, and it wasn't until I started, you know, shooting what I actually loved and stopped caring about making work that I really found my own voice. Um, authenticity is the most important thing in this world. I, you can't mimic other people and then expect to have the same results as them. Um, if you go out seeking inspiration, you're never gonna find it. Just shoot what is inspiring to you. And if you make work that you believe in, other people are gonna believe in it as well. It's, it's incredibly hard, but it's important to know that there's a value in what you're creating and what you see in your point of view. Even if you haven't made a cent off of it yet, um, I mean, we went from, 
you know, selling $3 postcards in a junkyard to creating content for some of the largest companies in the world. Um, now, I know our dream might not be the same as yours. In fact, this might be a living hell for some of you. <laughs> <laughs> it is for me, actually. <laughs> she loves it. Um, but there are things that will remain the same here, and that is that time will keep passing, and the circumstances will never be perfect for you to pursue something. You know, if we had waited for the exact right time, you'd still be at the burrito shop. I'd yeah, still we be would making have never left. Um, you can you can attach that logic to anything in your career. So whether it's an adventure that you've been putting off or maybe a personal project that you haven't been working on as much as you want to be. Um, or even as something as simple as just like feeling comfortable enough to share your work with other people. Um, I know for a lot of people that can be kind of the hardest part. Um, and we know there's never gonna be that right time to feel ready, so that's why we often refer to what we did as a leap. Um, you kind of just need to jump before you know where, where you're going to land. Um, hopefully it's not in a junkyard. But <laughs> at the same time, in between that jumping and the landing is going to be a lot of hard work. Um, nothing, easy, or nothing good comes without effort, and no one is just going to waltz into your living room one day and make all of these dreams you have come true. Um, so you need to get yourself out there, keep your goals in mind, and, and don't take your eyes off of them. And really, if we have any solid advice to share, it's start now, working on it in whatever way you can, um, and throw yourself wholeheartedly, commit to it, and just whatever happens, because things are really going to happen, um, just don't give up on it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's pretty good time.